I used to think fold back and feed back were the same thing. And then one day a bloke explained to me very, very slowly and in words of one syllable that one was bad and the other was good. <laughs> The cheer for Rish's beer and eat me pie. Wait for signal. Here it comes. Okay, welcome to the workshop, the story of a family. Uh, this is the, the story of my family in the form of song, yarn, poem, anecdote, and what have you. The name Dengate, from my research, uh, is evidently a corruption of the name Dungate. Uh, I'm rather glad they changed it. Uh, it's a little bit too close to Dunnygate. Um, and I believe that Dungate probably means Brown Gate. They came from a little village near the Kent-Sussex border in the south of England. They came to Australia in the 1830s. There were eight Dengates on a ship, a migrant ship, called the Westminster. They weren't convicts. I believe the only reason they weren't is because they weren't caught. <laughs> there were, or, I believe that all the Dengates and Dungates in Australia, there is a, actually a Dungate Lane in Sydney, so they were evident, evidently using both forms of the name. And I believe that all the Dengates in Australia, and there are hundreds and hundreds of them, are descended from those eight people who came on the Westminster in 1838. And I'll begin by reading a quote from Robert Hughes's The Fatal Shore. Wages for farm labourers were lowest in the southern counties. This is England in the 1830s. The Captain Swing Riots were the last labourers' revolt. Captain Swing, a mythical character in the north of England, he was known as Ned Ludd, hence the term Luddite. He was also a mythical character. <coughs> Captain Swing, a mythical character, protested against the loss of common ground through enclosure, against high wheat prices, efforts to force English farm labourers to eat potatoes instead of wheat and bread were indignantly rejected and against mechanisation. Once again, that's the link with Ned Ludd and Luddism. One threshing machine rented out and hauled from farm to farm could put a hundred men out of seasonal work. Almost 500 swing followers were transported to New South Wales and Van Diemen's Land in the 1830s. And from north, the north of England, probably even more Luddites were transported. That was the background, the historical background for my ancestors' migration to Australia, the Dengate side of my ancestry. My ancestor who was on that ship with his family, his name is also John Dengate, had evidently become a Wesleyan, a Wesleyan Methodist before he got on, he got on board. The Wesleyans in the 1830s were regarded as dangerous people. <coughs> John Wesley and his followers said the Anglican Church, the established Church of England and cynics have defined the Anglican Church as the Tory party at prayer. <laughs> and the Wesleyans said that the Anglican Church had let down the working people of England. They said the working people should have education, they should learn to read, so that they could read the Bible and their souls could be saved. <laughs> to which the Tories replied, to which the establishment replied, oh yes, Today, the Book of Common Prayer. Tomorrow, the Rights of Man. <laughs> and of course, they were correct. <laughs> so the Wesleyans were regarded with a good deal of suspicion. The Wesleyans were what we would now call, the Methodists they're now called, are still Wowsers. 
And they were wowsers because they saw the need to get the English working people off the booze. And remember, this was the time of Hogarth's Gin Lane. And they weren't even drinking gin. What we now call gin is not what they were drinking. It's like the early days of Australia. We talk about rum, the Rum Corps and the Rum Rebellion. Some of it was rum, but most of it was some infernal spirit far worse than rum. A lot of it was arrack, made from the root of the arrack palm. Now I'm telling you all this to give you the background to what things were like in England in the 1830s when my ancestors arrived. I believe that John Dengate joined the Wesleyans to get himself off the grog. Didn't work. <laughs> but here's my poem. Hasn't worked for his descendants either. Here's my poem. First of all, in Kent. This is the mental picture I have of my ancestors in Kent before they came to Australia in those terrible days of the 1830s. Ragged, itinerant, poor rural labourers, tramping round Wittersham, bodies for hire, unkempt, illiterate, helpless and ignorant, touching their forelocks to farmer and squire, shivering and shambling through parish and shire. And now from the research I did in the Mitchell Library on the ship, the Westminster. The records are there of every migrant ship. You can read every surgeon's report. And the surgeon's report on the Westminster was, a healthy ship, ten children died on that ship. The mumbled prayer, the chanted creed, the pious tracts they couldn't read. On stony ground they sowed the seed on the Westminster. On Sunday, singing hymns of praise, bowed head like sheep that safely graze, while one child died for each nine days on the Westminster. A healthy ship, the surgeon said, she wallowed in below North Head. A good round score, ten children dead on the Westminster. In Australia. Currawong song from Wathal in yellow masses, free of the servile symbol, the peasant's smock. Working the orchards with currency lads and lasses, and begging the blousy daughters of convict stock. Happy children, healthy, free and fearless, wild in the bush from dawn to dark, food and fistfights, beer and games of cricket, lean cheeky corn stalks, tough as iron bark. I'm grateful that you heeded Johnny Dengate that urgent voice that whispered in your ear, leave England, take your family to Australia. Thank God you listened and migrated here. <laughs> My great-great-grandfather, John Dengate, was married to Sarah Smith when he left England in 1838. Sarah has disappeared from history without trace. When he was killed in a fall from his horse in 1865, John Dengate was married to Anne Mobbs, the descendant of a convict who arrived in 1797 on the transport Barwell. Evidently there was a mutiny on the Barwell. Some convicts and sailors combined in an effort to take over the ship. The mutiny failed. Here's my word picture of what it was probably like on the convict ship Barwell for Isaac Mobbs, one of my ancestors. 
The first bombs in Australia were sent for seven years from the 96 assizes by a judge bewigged and fat who fed on human misery and thrived on blood and tears and whose instruments of justice were the gallows and the cat. The first mobs in Australia survived the journey out, verminous and vomiting for five long months and more. He prayed and cursed and sweated when the transport rolled about between decks in the barwell with his ankles ironed and raw. The first mobs in Australia survived. Sam Marsden's lash, starvation, scurvy, smallpox, and the heavy labouring hoe bought land near Parramatta for rum in lieu of cash and died a well-loved patriarch 14 decades ago. Up the houses. <laughs> Right, now I'm going to sing a song called The Death of Great Great Granddad to the tune of A Thousand Miles Away. In the song I say he uh, was killed in 1863 so I can get the rhyme with Black Buck True. <laughs> That's what songwriters and poets do, they bloody well cheat all the time. In fact it was 1865. This is a moral song, or if you prefer, a didactic song, a lesson in this for all of you. Great grand, I'm oh, sorry, great great granddad was an orchardist, an orchardist was he. He'd work like hell and have a spell and think about his free. For each soul was gripped by a terrible thirst I'm given you the drum He could only go but a week or so without the taste of rum He'd lace the fiery liquor with a raw tobacco blood He sweat and wool packed spirits in the burrows that he dug He'd ride the Parramatta from his orchard in the hill Ride the Parramatta and get shivered to the gills. You can see what I meant by John Wesley failing to get him off the ground. There is a Woolpack pub still in Parramatta, across the road from where the original Woolpack was. Where the original Woolpack was, I think there's now a police station. <laughs> The world is full of irony. <laughs> Obliging fellow drinkers when the spree had run its course would place unconscious great granddad upon his waiting horse. The horse, it was a handsome beast, a well bred racing mare, but the drunken wreck around its neck had filled you with despair. <laughs> he laced the fiery liquor with a raw tobacco plug. He sweated all pack spirits in the furrows that he dug. He'd ride the Parramatta from his orchard in the hills. Ride the Parramatta and get chicken to the gills. But hearken to my softy boys, for what I sing is true. My forebears and you may depend a lesson holds for you. The blood may have bucked a rider off against the black bug tree, and he died by the trap with a broken back in 1863. <laughs> He'd laced the fiery liquor with the raw tobacco plug. He sweat and wool packed spirits in the furrows that he dug. He'd ride the Parramatta from his orchard in the hills. Ride the Parramatta and get chicken to the gills. My father said that when he was a boy, he remembered his father taking him down along 
Bennett Hills Road, which was then just a dirt road, and beside the road there was a stone peg that said J.D. 1865, where he'd been killed from his horse. Of course, they long ago widened Bennett Hills Road, and that stone peg is long gone. My great grandfather, Jabez, it's a little wonderful one. <laughs> My great grandfather, Jabez, was born in England and arrived with his family as a young child. I don't think he would have remembered him. He also married an Anne Mott. But it's all right, there's, there was no inbreeding. <laughs> because Jabez, remember, was Anne Smith's son, and we don't know what happened to her. She disappeared. I think she probably committed suicide down a well. It was very popular. <laughs> <laughs> he also married an Anne Mott. And that's how the Dengates acquired 27 acres of orchard beside Carlingford Road. <laughs> Truly linked with the mobs. And of course, those of you know who any, know anything about that part of Sydney, there's Mobs Hill, Mobs Lane, and so on. The, the mobsers, although the first mobs arrived as a convict, they did very well. They were good farmers. So that's how the Dengates finished up with an orchard in Carlington Road. Anne and Jabez were the parents of Henry. Henry married Isabella McKnight, who had arrived as a child from Northern Ireland in the 1870s. They had four children. The third was my father, Norm, born on the family orchard in 1908. Dad was the source of all the stories. It was as if he was born to be the keeper of the stories. His brothers knew no stories. His sister knew no stories. Dad was the only one who remembered any of these things. Okay, this is the Peach Pickers song. Dad grew up on that orchard, and all through my childhood he told me stories about the orchard. When I first I joined the Bush Music Club in the early 1960s and I'd come, I'd come home with the Sing About magazines and I just bought a guitar and I could just barely pick out the tunes and I'd sit there laboriously after a day's teaching. This was in the days when you could go and teach the kids and come home and do something else. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, that was those days long ago. <laughs> anyway, I'd, I'd come home from school and I'd get the guitar and I'd get the Sing About magazine and hear it. Here I was trying to learn the songs out of the, out of the sing about it. So, my father had come home from the factory, the sheet metal shops, and he'd say, What's that song you're trying to learn? I said, Oh, it's a song about shearers, Dad. The next day he came home from work, he said, What's that song about? I said, A song about shearing, Dad. So he said to me, Far too many bloody songs about shearers by far. <laughs> I said, well, right over it. I said, you grew up on an orchard. Why don't you make one up about that? I was oh, God. Anyway, he came home from work the next day and on a scrap of paper he had written, on with your pulling shirts and get the peaches in. There's 20 to the half case and 40 to the gin. Take them down to Wormington and whack them on the barge. Half ripes, mediums, and extra bloody large. <laughs> he says, do whatever you like. <laughs> I said, Dad, Dad, that's wonderful. That's the chorus. That's the chorus. <laughs> so I wrote a set of verses based on his stories to go with that chorus, and I set it to... Flashjack from Gundy Girls. <laughs> Here's the song. Joint effort, Dad and myself. <laughs> oh, the boat goes down the river and it comes to the quay where the agents fall upon it to extricate their fee. But we don't get a penny, it's a dirty damn shame. Just a bill for dumping charges, fortune is the game. On with your pulling shirts and get the peaches in. Twenty to the half case, forty to the gin. Take them down to Wormington and whack them on the barge. Half rights, mediums and extra bloody large. Down 
to the timber and harness up old Jack. Oh, we get the ploughing finished while the fruit season slack. It's only single furrow and I'm telling you the worst. We'll descend the Parramatta with the man-sized thirst. On with your pollen shirts, get the pictures in. Twenty to the fur case, forty to the gin. Take them down to Wormington and whack them on the barge. Half rights, mediums and extra bloody large. We gotta beat the cottle and moss, so get the bag and climb. The grog in Parramatta will have to bide its time. We're trying to scratch a living, we're trying to make a crust. From a row of mangy fruit trees dying in the dust. On with your pulling shirts and get the beaches in. Twenty to the hard case, forty to the gin. Take them down to Wormington and whack them on the barge. Half rights and mediums and extra bloody large. Well, I'll tell you some of the stories that Dad told me about his childhood on the orchard in Carlington Road. He said there was a poor old fella who used to board with them. And uh, I think my grandmother, old Isabella, I think she probably took pity on this old bloke. And uh, he used to, he was a fencer in the district. And evidently he came home one day and he said to my grandfather, Henry, some thieving bastards pinched me post office. <laughs> <laughs> my grandfather said, now come on, Tommy. Everybody around here knows you. No one would steal your post -ols. He said, no, he said, fair and they're gone. Some bastards pinched them. <laughs> he said, well, come on, I'll get, I'll get the horse and car out. And he said, well, we'll go up. He said, you, you, you can show me where you dug the post and we'll find them. They must be still there. <laughs> so he said, they went out in the horse and car and they went along. And the old Tommy said, it was here, Henry, this is where I dug them. I know, I had this spot marked by the three iron bark saplings. So my grandfather looked around and he said, well, they don't seem to be here, Tommy. He said, but there's another ridge just along there with three iron bark saplings on it. How about we go up and have a look there? So I went up there and there's the post office. <laughs> and old Tom shook and said, he said, well, what do you know? He said, someone's played a trick on me and moved <laughs> grandfather said, well, Tom, these things can happen. He said, uh, I reckon to make sure nothing like this happens in the future, what you should do is buy yourself an old disused well. And then you could cut it up and use it for spare post <laughs> And the boy said, by God, Henry, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> Well, Dad, Dad reckons that, that when, when him and his brothers were, were there um, alone in the house and uh, their parents were out, they'd go and get the shotgun. And they'd go down into the orchard, into the scrub, and they'd start firing at the, at the parrots way up on the top of the big gum trees. There's really big timber around Carlingford in those days, really big trees. Even when I was a kid, there was still a lot of big timber there. Said so we'd shoot at the parrots way up on the top of the trees. And they weren't very environmentally conscious. <laughs> And he said, an old Jim Bevan, went, as soon as he heard, boom, as soon as he heard the shotgun, he'd come running down. He said, what are you kids fire at? He said, oh, Mr. Bevan, them parrots way up on the top of that tree there. He said, you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be trying to fire. You shouldn't be trying to hit something that eye. You'll strain the gun. <laughs> What worries me about these stories is that they were true. <laughs> <laughs> so Dad, when he, when he, Dad said when he, when he was about nine, because Dad, Dad was born in 1908, so this would have made it during World War I. During <coughs> World War I, Dad was about nine years old, he went and saw his mother and he said, Mum, could I buy a mouse organ? 
I want to learn the mouth organ. She said, well, Norm, you can save up and buy a mouth organ. So he said, I saved up my pennies, and he said, I bought a mouth organ. He said, the first tune I learned to play was... What tune is that? There's a long, long trail of wine in that beautiful tune from World War I. There's a long, long trail of winding into the land of my dreams and so on. And he said he was getting pretty good at there's a long, long trail of winding. You can tell why he picked that for his first tune. He admitted that was the reason. <laughs> and he said, I was playing, well, I was getting pretty good. He said, I learned there's a long, long trail of wine. And he said, I, I, I could play a couple of other tunes as well. And he said, and one day a fella came up to me and he said, son, you're playing that mouth organ backwards. <laughs> <laughs> so you're playing it the wrong way around. <clears throat> and I thought, well, I'm only a little kid and he's a big man. He must know more than me. So he said, I turned it around and I learned to play it the other way. <laughs> And he said, bugger me dead, I was right the first time. <laughs> <laughs> and he never ever learned to play it the right way around. Right? <laughs> now that tell me that the train line that runs from Carlingford to Clyde, which is now just a part of the Sydney suburban rail system, was originally built to carry the fruit from the orchards. Uh, before then, the fruit, as the song, uh, the uh, Peach Picker song suggests, the fruit used to be taken by bars down the Parramatta, Parramatta River. They'd, they'd load the fruit onto a cart, they'd take it down to the wharf at Ermington, and there it'd be loaded onto the barges, go down the Parramatta River, finish up at the quay, there it'd be unloaded, and as that song said, generally they didn't get a cheque. Quite often they got a bill for dumping charges and a little note saying, fruit unsaleable. But um, then the next step was they thought it would be a good idea to build this railway line from Carlingford across to Clyde to carry the fruit. And Dad said the nickname for the train was the Apricot Express. <laughs> now here's a song called the Apricot Express. Appropriately, the tune I have stolen this time is the American Railway song, Casey Jones. If you're going to steal tunes, steal good tunes. <laughs> oh, the Parramatta River was the only way to get the fruit to market in my grandfather's day. So they put their heads together and the people cried. Build a line from Carlingford across to Clyde. Across to Clyde, they didn't dilly dally. Across to Clyde, the growers to impress. Across to Clyde, around the Dundas Valley, and the rolling stock was known as the Apricot Express. Oh, its majesty and power made the people stare As it thundered through Camellia and Rydal there And they asked the Lord that they might be allowed to ride Beside the crates of apples on the Carlingford to Clyde Across to Clyde, they didn't dilly-dally Across to Clyde, the growers to impress Across to Clyde, around the Landas Valley And the rolling stock was known as the Apricot Express The Canadian Pacific is a famous line And the man who pioneered it said, I suppose it's fine But for feats of engineering he just had to confess He never saw the equal of the Apricot Express Across to Clyde Hooray for man's endeavour Across to Clyde Nine miles there and back Across to Clyde I reckon there was never 
So many bloody orchardists per hundred foot of track. <laughs> Dad was a staunch Carlingford boy. He was born in Carlingford Road. He played cricket for Carlingford. He played soccer for Carlingford. And when he built a house just after World War II in Willoughby Street, and that was the house in which I grew up, Willoughby's, the address was 22 Willoughby Street, Carlingford. And then some bastard in the post office changed the address to Eddie. <laughs> it became 22 Willoughby Street Epic. Dad was furious. He repeatedly with an Epic. <laughs> I actually remember when I was little, the kid next door was a few, few years older than me, and I said to him one day, where are you going, Brian? And he said, down to Epping to bash up the kids what wear shoes. <laughs> Boys wearing shoes was considered extremely feminine in the 1940s. <laughs> well, as I said, Dad was a Carlingford boy. He went to Carlingford school. And uh, here's a couple of stories about, about growing up in Carlingford. He was a very keen cricketer. He was very disappointed in me when I was very young because I wasn't a good enough cricketer. Very disappointed in me. It took me many, many years to live that down. I didn't invest, I got fingers going in all directions, smashed up like cricket balls. Anyway, he said, when he used to play cricket for Carlingford, he said, at the beginning of the season, they'd have a club meeting. And the clubhouse was a little shed on one of the orchards. He said, we all squeeze into the little shed, and there was a, a fruit case with a kerosene lamp on it. And of course, there's straw all around the place. And he said, we're having the meeting, and the cricket gear over in the corner. He said, we're having the meeting. The meeting was going along all right until some bloke said, stood up and said, there's one bloke in the A team who should be in the B team. And he stared at this fellow. And this fellow said, would you be referring to me? And the bloke said, if the cap fits, wear it. So this bloke jumped up and threw a haymaker. But as he was showing the punch, he went over the top of the fruit case that had the kerosene lamp on it. The kerosene lamp smashed on the floor and up went the straw in flames and the clubhouse caught a light. No, that's it. We were all trying to get out the door at once. <laughs> he said, by the time we got out, the place was burnt down. There was no hose. We had to get buckets of water. He said, by the time he put the fire out, all the gear was burnt, the score books and everything. He said, then when we had to start the season, we turned up to play against Brush Park. We had no gear. Brush Park said, where's your gear? We had to say, burnt down with the clubhouse. <laughs> Only cricket team ever to burn down their own clubhouse. <laughs> <laughs> Once, so they were always a bit short of gear, you see, Carney, but they were infamous for their lack of gear. And one day they were playing against their old enemies, Brush Farm, called Brush Park, you know. And Brush Park, Brush Farm had a really good fast bowler and was going through the Carlingford batsman because the bloke could get out and, and uh, <coughs> a bit short of pads. <laughs> and there was a bit of a gap when the fella got out and the, and the next fella was due to come in. And the Brush Farm captain said to the uh, umpire, he's only got two minutes. If he's not out here on the ground within two minutes, I'll appeal. And the umpire said, and I'll give him out. And the Carlingford captain was standing there fuming at the bowler's end. He'd been watching the, crick, the wicket spoil at the other end. And he said, you wouldn't do that, you bastard, would you? The fellow said, my oath, I would. And they're all in there, hurry up, hurry up, get the pads on, get the pads on. This bloke's supposed to be getting his pads on. Two minutes is up. The fellow says, how's that? The umpire says, out. So the Carlingford captain threw down his back and he pulled the stump out of the ground and he attacked the brush farm captain with the stump and then he, then he attacked the umpire with the stump. <laughs> so the game was abandoned and he was called upon to apologise at a meeting of the Northern Districts Cricket Association. He called upon to apologise to the umpire and he went along and he said, I'll apologise when hell freezes over. <laughs> Very strong feelings about that. <laughs> Dad, Dad had a cap, I've got it now, and it had on it, 
Um, NDCA. As a kid, I used to say, what's it stand for? Daddy used to say, Norm Dengate's Cricket. <laughs> <laughs> It's actually Northern Districts Cricket Association. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dad, as well as playing cricket for Carling, but he also played soccer for Carling. But he said, we used to regularly win the competition. And he said, look, after we'd won the competition one year, they said, well, you're going to have to play the winners of one of the other club comps. And he said, oh, right, oh, that'll be good. So they said, the game's at North Rocks. You're playing Lilyfield. And we said, oh, geez, where's Lilyfield? I said, oh, it's one of them inner city places. So he said, these fellas came out from Lilyfield, the team and all their supporters, in broken down uh, old trucks with the, all the supporters and the team bouncing around on the tray on the back of the trucks. He said, oh, shit, they're a puffer of the lot. <laughs> he said, they no sooner got off the trucks than they wanted to bet with our supporters on the result of the game. They wanted to support the Lilyfield team. He said, yeah, we're, ba we're backing us. And they were back on the Lilyfield mob. He said, before the game started, he said, the soccer ball was on the ground and uh, we were just organising to kick off. He said, this fella came over with his hand inside his coat, one of the Lilyfield supporters. And he said to the Lilyfield captain, which ball do you want to use, Jimmy? Their ball or our ball? And the Lilyfield captain said, um, our ball. So he said, this bloke pulled a revolver from under his coat and he blew the car into the soccer ball to put the gun back in his coat. <laughs> and that said, he said, we said, geez, this doesn't look too good. <laughs> I said, ah, oh, come on, let's get stuck into these blokes anyway. He said, these bloody raw bone orchards, he said, we kicked the Christ out of this. <laughs> He said, we won easily. He said, as we walked off the field, he said, oh, what's going to happen now, do you reckon? Bloke with a gun. He said, but nothing happened. They just paid up the bets. Yeah. And back they went to the little field. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we're coming up to the depression years. And uh, at the beginning of the workshop, I passed around the book, and I'm sure it's still going around the room, with a picture of Mum. A beautiful country girl. Now, Mum, for all intents and purposes, was an orphan. She never knew who her father was. She was brought up by her grandmother in the town of Gundigai. And um, she came to Sydney in the early 30s with her sister, or I reckon her half-sister, my auntie Phyllis, my late auntie Phyllis. They came to Sydney looking for work. Um, Phyllis was a holy terror. There wasn't much of her, but she was fierce. Phyllis killed. And uh, Mum said, one thing about being Phyllis's sister, no one else bashed you up. <laughs> Mum said, the boys in Gundy Guy were terrified of Phyllis. <laughs> Well, this is leading, of course, to the song Barely to Cape. Dad met Mum through mutual friends, and uh, he went home and he said to his mother, old Isabella McKnight, Northern Irish Protestant, this is in the 1930s, he said, Mum, I've met a Catholic girl from the bush. And old Isabella, she must have been ecumenical well before her time. She said, well, Norman, if she's a decent girl, she's welcome in this house. So Dad said that was good because he said your mother could come to the orchard, come to the house on the orchard. He said, we didn't have money, but he said, at least we had food. We had chooks, we had eggs, we had vegetables. He said, and we could feed up your poor mum because she was starving. And Dad told me stories about what it was like in North Sydney, Princes Street, North Sydney, where Mum lived with her sister Phyllis, Phyllis's two sons, my two worthless cousins, Barry and Bob, <laughs> and their poor father, my poor late uncle Sid, Arthur, 
five of them in the one house. Mum was earning 17 shillings and sixpence a week as a waitress. And you had to divide that 17 shillings and sixpence by five. Comes out to less than four bob each. Dad said, this was the rich house in the street. He said, your mother was the only one in this whole street who had a job. He said, all the rest were living on the susso, the sustenance. He said, they used to have street meetings. And he said, the convener of the street meeting always took Auntie Phyllis along to stand beside him. <laughs> and Phyllis would stand there and glare around. And the convener of the street meeting would say, what are we going to do about the bloody gas meters? Because it used to be sixpence in the slot to get gas. Of course, they didn't have sixpence. They couldn't get gas to boil up a cup of tea. So some, someone came up with a suggestion. He said, I've got an idea. He said, we get one sixpence. Only not one. He said, knock the bottoms out of all the gas meters. Get one sixpence. Put it in the gas meter, catch it when it comes out the bottom, and that's the gas sixpence. And we pass it up and down the street. Apparently the convener of the meeting said, well, uh, that's been moved. Is it seconded? And someone seconded. He said, uh, any discussion? And they were all talking. So we looked at Arnie Phyllis, and the Arnie Phyllis said, I reckon it's a good idea. So they all voted. <laughs> <laughs> so someone got a sixpence from somewhere, and it was solemnly deemed to be the gas sixpence. And Dad said for months, this sixpence went up and down the street. And they'd call for it across the fences. Gas sixpence! <laughs> then Dad said the poor bloke had come from the gas company, get the money out of the meters. And he'd come into the first house and there's a hole in the bottom of the meter and no money. And he'd say, I'll get the sack! <laughs> and they'd say, don't you worry, Mr McNamara, you sit down and I'll make you a nice cup of tea. <laughs> And then one day, one day, my auntie Phyllis got a call from the bloke who lived next door and he called out, Mrs. Watson, could you please come to the fence? So my auntie Phyllis went out and said, yeah, what do you want? And the fellow next door said, Mrs. Watson, you know the gas sit? He said, yeah, what about it? He said, well, Mrs. Watson, I've done a terrible thing. She said, what have you done? He said, well, Mrs. Watson, I got a check on the pony races at Kensington. <laughs> and I put the gas sixpence on this horse and it's still running. <laughs> he said, for God's sake, Mrs. Watson, don't tell the others, they'll kill me. The only fellas grabbed him by the throat and lifted him over the fence and said, no, they won't, I'll kill you myself. <laughs> He said, Uncle Sid and his mates, none of them had any work, and he said they used to sit round all day in the gutter in North Sydney wondering how they were going to make a couple of bob or at least get a beer. And one day one of them said, if the publican of the North Sydney Hotel won the lottery, he'd shout. <laughs> <laughs> and they all looked at him and someone said, well, he probably would, but he's not going to win the lottery, is he? This bloke said, he might think he has. <laughs> but I all looked at him and said, go on. <laughs> and he said, well, it's like this. He said, I've checked it. He buys lottery tickets and he puts them on a bulldog trip in the bottle department. He said, all we've got to do, someone's just going to walk in the bar and distract his attention while one of the others goes into the bottle department and just scribbles down the details of the current lottery ticket. It'll be on the top of the bundle under the bulldog clip. Then we ring him up and tell him he's won the lottery. One of the blokes said, where are we going to get the penny for the phone call? He said, get a penny from somewhere. <laughs> so they did. One of the blokes sauntered into the bar and the publican said, what are you doing in here catching drinks? Piss off. He said, no, I just come in to say good morning, Mr. O'Reilly. I just come in to say good morning. He said, well, you've said good morning, now piss off. <laughs> so 
So out he went. It was enough time for the other bloke to take the necessary details from the bottle partner. Then they went round the corner to a phone booth and they got this penny from somewhere and they rang him up. This bloke says, is that Mr O'Reilly of the North Sydney Hotel? Yes. Well, Mr O'Reilly, this is the lottery office. Have you got a ticket in lottery number 134? He said, I think so, hang on. <laughs> he went and got his ticket, trying to pull the clip. He said, yes, yes, yes. But I said, is it ticket number 5032? He said, yes, yes. He said, congratulations, Mr O'Reilly, you won the lottery. He said, you're bloody beauty. So they all hung up and raced around and sauntered very slowly past the pub. He said, come in, boys. Come in, come in. You'll never guess what's happened. He said, I've won the lottery. They're all shaking hands with him. Good on you, Mr O'Reilly. It couldn't happen to a nicer bloke. He said, boys, I'm shouting. I said, oh, no, Mr. O'Reilly, no, no, we don't want that. <laughs> no, I'm shouting. <sure. laughs> so he's pouring them all a beer, and they're all standing there on the other side of the bar, sipping their beer and looking at their feet, guilt <laughs> all over their feet. <laughs> <laughs> and he's looking at them, and he can see the guilt written on their head. <laughs> so he moves in the direction of the telephone to ring the lottery office and check. And as soon as they saw him move towards the telephone, <laughs> they put down their beer and ran for their life down Blues Point Road as fast as they could. With me poor Uncle Sid with his club foot bringing up the rear. <laughs> because he's the one who got the belt. <laughs> All right, now this is Mum's song, Barely Did Kate. Dad, Mary, the Catholic girl from Gummy Guy, the girl of Irish descent. And that's why I'm here singing you songs and telling you guys. To the tune of Bare Legged Joe, Bare Legged Kate. Bare Legged Kate with your natural grace, the big sad eyes and the Irish face. A poor bush girl when the summer is high In the stony hills of Gundagai Fair-legged Kate, why do you weep When the men ride by with the travelling sheep does the sight of the drover make you sad? Do you think of the father you never had? Bare-legged Kate with your natural grace The big sad eyes and the Irish face A poor bush girl when the summer is high In the stony hills of Gundagai Fair Lady Kate, why do you run Down by the creek in the setting sun Down where the eyes of the world cannot see Run Kate, run from poverty Your natural grace, the big sad eyes and the Irish face. A poor bush girl when the summer is high in the stony hills of Gundagai. Fair legged Kate, there is gold in the hills, but you know that the cyanide process kills. Poisons the miners and cuts them down In the mean little homes below the town Fair-legged cake with your natural grace The big sad eyes and the Irish 
space. A porpoise girl when the summer is high in the stony hills of Gundagai. <coughs> Bare-legged Kate when the floods come down it's the poor on the creeks are the ones who drown when the great Murrumbidgee is thundering by through the haunted hills of Gundagai. Fair-legged cake with your natural grace, the big sad eyes and the Irish face. A bush girl when the summer is high In the haunted hills of Gundagai Six, she is the terror of the retirement village. <laughs> They've just given her a pacemaker. I reckon she's good for another ten years. <laughs> As I say, Dad's younger brother was Eric. Um, Dad said that when they went to school at Carlingford, one day his mother, old Isabella, called Dad in and said, Norman, you will have to look after Eric because Fred won't. Fred was the older brother and evidently Fred said, he's on his own, he's on his own. Eric was uncontrollable. But Dad took looking after Eric very, very seriously. When they were kids at school, he'd say to Eric, now Eric, have you got your lunch? No, end it at 11 o'clock. <laughs> he said, well, here's one of my sandwiches. Now, Eric, when the teacher lets you out at half past three, I want you to meet me here at the gate. We've got to go straight home. And Dad said, you get out of the class now, Eric. Good fight, Eric. So he'd say, anyone seen me, brother Eric? Yeah, he's down the back fighting Duck Isles. Oh, no, he's not allowed to get into fights, said my father. I've got to look after him. I've got to take him home. Well, that's where he is. He's down the back fighting Duck Isles. And Dad said, I'd go down and there's Eric. Fighting Duck Isles with Duck Isles' big brother refereeing. <laughs> so I'd go over and I'd say, No, no, he's not allowed to get into fights. I've got to take him home. And Duck Isles' big brother would say, What's the matter? They're in the same class. They're well matched. I'll fight you. So Dad said, I had to fight the big brother of every kid in the school of Eric Ford. <laughs> and that was just about after school. <laughs> he said, I spent my life fighting the big brothers of kids that Eric fought. <laughs> Eric was a lovable larrikin. And uh, when World War II started, Eric joined the AIF. And he, he was in New Guinea. He was in Moresby. And he was in a unit called the Independent Docks Company. They used to unload the ships. Um, what happened was the wharfies, when the Japs bombed hell out of Darwin, there were a lot of wharfies killed, and the wharfies said, unload your own bloody boats. So the army said to the wharfies, well, look, the docks companies, will you train them to unload the boats? So the wharfies did that, and, and in the war zones, ships were loaded and unloaded by AIF troops. And uh, Eric was in Moresby and all these other places unloading boats because I knew we were American boats, American ships. Eric said, it didn't matter how they labelled the boxes carrying the grog. <laughs> <laughs> we found it. <laughs> he said, we were unloading this American ship one day and someone said, sand sap. <laughs> he said, so for the next hour, all we did was unload boxes labelled sand soap. He said, we took and hit them in the scrub. <laughs> he said, eventually, this American officer came down the companionway and said, 
Could you guys please steal something from the other side of the hold? The ship's starting to lose. <laughs> wonderful uncle a little boy could have had and he had the priceless gift of laughter everything was turned into a joke even his own suffering Bloody Bob Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> Stronger 
than suffering and pain. My name's Eric Ben Gage. I'm 71. My lungs are in tatters and my race it is run. The strength it is ebbing from this withered old hand. I leave you my laughter and the love of my land, my legacy's laughter and the love. Okay, just two more songs. Song of Childhood. This is about growing up in the 1940s when we thought we owned the road. We used to play cricket on that strip of tar outside the house in Willoughby Street. We thought it must have been put there for us to play cricket on. There didn't seem to be any other reason for putting the strip of tar down the middle of a road. And if a car came along, which was a fairly rare occurrence, the car went round the cricket. <laughs> for two reasons. One, we owned the road. And two, cricket is more important than a bloody motor car. <laughs> Turned out we didn't own the road, and it turned out that Uncle Eric and Uncle Fred and all those people who had saved Australia from the horrors of invasion, turned out that they weren't immortal. It turned out that they were very mortal. And it turned out we didn't own the road. It turned out we didn't own anything. childhood gone time has plundered the years stolen my gift of golden days left me with ashes and tears I've wandered along the lonely roads over the paddocks I run drunk with the summer cicada song Drug me with freedom and sun Take me back to a fibro house In a suburb carved from the bush Give me an acre of lawn to cut And a rusty old mower to push Give me a summery Saturday just after the war was won With Dad and my uncles drinking beer Sprawled on the grass in the sun They spoke with a curious proud elan Their laughter was careless and free Fresh from the battles against Japan They seemed immortal to me but how can an innocent boy discern what's fallible, false or true? Their mortal footsteps are faltering now, and mine are faltering too. Bring out the bat and the worn cork wall, and we'll fall at an old wooden case. She'll jump and turn off the asphalt road She'll come at a lively pace But barefoot, careless and undismayed Will drive and hammer and glance But the ball lies lost in the tangled years my hands couldn't hold the chance. Song of Charles.